Praise God. Good morning and welcome to Living Hope Cathedral, a place of new beginnings. Can you stand with me this morning as we read Psalms 34, just verses 1 to 3? It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Can we just bless the Lord this morning wherever you are? Just lift your hands in his presence and just bless the Lord this morning because he is such an awesome God. He is such a faithful God. Even though we are not faithful, he remains faithful. His love for us is unfailing, and we owe it all to him this morning, to just magnify his name this morning, to just exalt his name together this morning. So we just say, thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for your hand of provision. You provide everything that we need. You know the trees need rain, Lord God, and you provide. You are such an awesome God, and so we just exalt you. And we lift up your name on high this morning. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Lord God. We bless your name. Hallelujah. Oh, come, let us adore him this morning. He is Christ the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Born the King of Angels 
we bless your holy name. Lord, we thank you, Lord God. We worship your majesty. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Oh 
Amen. Can we just continue in that vein? Sister Raquel, can you sing that last verse one more time? And even in this moment, even in this moment, can we all lift our hands and celebrate the King of Kings? of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. And this is one of my favorite sayings. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is this King of glory. And this morning, that is exactly what we're going to continue to do, to believe that the Lord, the King of glory, will fight our battles. And all we have to do this morning is to stand still and see the salvation of God. So can we pray? Father in heaven, we give you praise this morning. We thank you for who you are. We declare you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are our King of glory. And we thank you for the hope that you have given us to Jesus Christ our Lord. And this morning, we thank you for being here in our presence. We know in your presence, oh God, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So we receive receive you today. Open our hearts to receive the love of the Father and we give you praise for being and doing only what you can do in and through our service. So we give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise because you are deserving. You have kept us, oh God. You have kept us and because of that, we will forever bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. And on behalf of our senior pastors, Pastor Call and Dr. Reva Richardson, we welcome you to Living Hope Cathedral, a place of new beginnings. Can we just celebrate our pastor as he comes? Put your hands together for Pastor Call.
Well, good morning. I can hear you. Good morning. Yeah, you may be seated. We give God thanks for his unfailing love for the people of God. We give God thanks for what sometimes we will see as a negative. And God is actually making it a positive. So I thank God for the rain that has fallen on our land. Virgin Islands looks so green and beautiful, and it's happening at the time of the year, Christmas. I'm getting excited by Christmas because God sent someone to cut my hair on Saturday, and he began to share with me all of the excitement that's happening in his house, and I got jealous for Christmas. So I'm going to preach to you today, and then I'm going to go and begin to create a spirit of Christmas at my house. Uh, I heard about all those couples in our church who are um, cuddling up, drinking hot chocolate, and watching Hallmark's movies. And so um, you are better than your pastor, and you're ahead of your pastor. Give yourselves a hand. And um, But I'm going to catch up, okay? So tell your neighbor he's going to catch up. So today I want to continue to speak to you about um, you're in good hands. I first want to... Commend the church for your patience. I know there's a strong anointing upon our congregation and upon the sanctuary and upon my life um, last Sunday. And I believe that it was for a reason that God began through the Holy Spirit that reveals all truth to speak to his people. And he did so in incredible ways. And so i like uh, to finish that sermon up to you. But as always, um, <clears throat> as we go through these changing seasons, I also like to commend many of you who, had, who have remained consistent during these difficult and challenging times that has raised a lot of concerns and uncertainty about our finances, about our future, and about our lives. You have continued to give, um, and I just want to celebrate you. It's not easy to give and to deny yourselves and to give sacrificially um, when you may have other needs or concerns that are looming and that are large in your minds. And so I give God thanks for many of you you have used the Mobile Cars app, the online giving to our website, and you have given your gifts. There are many of you, whether you're here or you're far away, regardless of where the Spirit of Lord, of Lord or the circumstances of life may have led you to, um, because of um, earthly concerns, um, even there, your heart is for the ministry and for the kingdom of our Lord and His Christ and for what He is doing here at Living Hope Cathedral. And so I celebrate many of you who have mailed in your gifts as far as we as Philadelphia, Texas, and all those places, we bless you and we honor you. Thank you for doing that. We even have people who are not members of the church came by and gave me a love gift. He said this was for the building fund. Uh, Mr. Fleming, um, $100. Could you give him a hand? I give God thanks for you. Um, another love gift um, that came in, and so we give God thanks for that. We have someone who gave me a card. The card was so beautiful. I want to thank you. Um, sis for writing and celebrating me and my wife for our sacrifice and for being faithful to God's house. But she also gave a, a gift and a seed offering for the land. Um, so it just tells you that people are still praying and are still mindful for the land. And then for those of you who are giving online, just keep doing it. Um, and so we've received two um, major checks from Mobile Cars because of your giving um, that continues to allow us to pay our bills on time and continue to allow us um, to minister um, hope, healing, deliverance, and salvation from this place. So could you give yourselves a hand before I pray for you? You can do better than that. Give yourselves a real hand. I just want to honor you. Give God thanks for you. And for those of you who have taken a hiatus, a sabbatical from giving, as we get ready and position ourselves for 2021, I just want to encourage you to restore and renew your faith and to begin to believe God for incredible and great things and that he's going to return and restore our fortunes in 2021, and that <clears throat> everything that the devil seek to steal from us in 2020, 2020 will be returned in 2021. How many of you believe that? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And so we're asking you to just elevate your faith and continue to honor God with your giving. Could you lift up your hands? I just want to bless you. Father, we love you. We thank you for your people. We bless and establish the works of their hands because you have said it. Father God, you are mindful. You pay attention to their concerns. You hear the cries of their hearts. You're attentive to their faith, that they have demonstrated 
through your faithfulness to their house, and through serving and honoring you as long as you live, through their personal devotion, their prayers, and their worship. I pray that you'll be a part of your life. I pray that you'll surround them with good health. Recurse the devourer for their sakes. May you defend them against sickness, affliction, and disease, Father God. And may their latter days be greater. Glory to God. I say it again. May their latter days be greater. Glory to God. I say it again under the unction of your spirit. And may their latter days be greater. To the honor and glory of God the Father. And all God's people say, Amen, amen and Amen. Could you turn with me in your Bibles? <clears throat> to 1 Peter chapter 5, and so we're going to finish this sermon we started last week, and then we're going to get into the Christmas holidays, and we're going to have a nice, feel-good Christmas series, but I believe that this sermon did so much in terms of teaching us about faith, and about having faith during difficult times when we're faced with unfair treatment and persecution, when we're faced with fiery, fiery trials, as Peter and so many other people refer to it. Back in their day, I believe there's <clears throat> those of us who can refer to the, t the circumstances we're going through or find ourselves in to not only sometimes be tragic of tragic proportions, but also to be fiery trials. And so First Peter <clears throat> verses 1 to 11, he says, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also was shown the glory to be revealed. He admonishes us, those who are spiritually mature, to be shepherds, to help to guide the flock of the Lord Jesus Christ and of God that is under your care and to watch over them, not because you must, but because you are willing. As God wants you to be, he wants you to be willing, not pursuing dishonest gain, but you are eager to serve, not lording it over those who, who are entrusted to you, but you are being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are young, submit yourselves to your elders, all of you. Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under, the, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be alert, be of a sober mind. For your enemy, the devil, say he's your enemy, he is your enemy. Your enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone that he can destroy. The Bible says resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that the family, that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, he himself will restore you he will make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Verse 11, to him be the power forever and ever. Amen. So here we have the Apostle Peter that is speaking to um, the early church, and they are faced with extreme hardships, and he's encouraging them. And he's doing so along the lines of Moses, God's servant. In Numbers 12 and verse 3, it says there was none who was as humble as Moses. And so we see that humility was the mark of Moses' life. And in the book of Deuteronomy, as Moses is getting ready to leave his people, they are a younger generation, they are full of energy and vigor. Um, he realized that they needed new leadership. They needed leadership that was capable of taking them into warfare. And so he's designating Joshua to do so. But he's also giving them words that he wanted them to pay heed to. He's saying that we have been here before. We have been on the threshold of this promise before. I know for 40 years, uh, I've only succeeded twice in bringing you to the very thing that God promised you. And the first time ended in a disaster. And the first time ended in a disaster because we appealed to the conviction of men. We began to be, uh, make God's promise subject to a democratic process. And we we're saying, you know what, God promised it. But we're going to see how many of you are up for the promise and how many of you are not up for the promise. And we know that that went poorly. Um, and so because of that, they wandered for 40 years. But this is the second generation, and now they're here again. And he wants to tell them that God is going to do everything that he has promised, even though it seems like he failed the first time. And the reason he failed the first time was because of their sin and disobedience. But a lot of times as life goes on, 
we, we could remember where, where God failed us and we don't see our own failings. Because it's hard to look at ourselves and it's hard to judge ourselves in any equation um, and to truly understand why am I here. And so Mo Moses is saying to them again, I want you to pay attention to several things. That God is going to do it for you even though the first time you came you failed. The second time you will go into the promised land. He's telling them why. He's telling them why. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 31, which is towards the end of the book in verse 8, Moses shares with them something that is along the lines that the Apostle Peter shares with you today and that I want to bring to remembrance. He says, the Lord himself, the Lord himself goes before you and he will be with you. So don't pay attention that there's going to be a change in leadership. Don't pay attention that all of a sudden you're not being led by Moses, you're being led by Joshua. There has really been no significant change when it comes to the sovereignty and the participation of God in your life. And he's saying, I want you to keep your eyes on the ball. Keep your eyes on the, on the person that matters, and that is God himself. As you look at your circumstances, pay attention that it is God himself. Whom? God himself. Say with me, God himself. Say with me, whom? God himself. I know your faith can be shaken when you begin to see change. And you say, wow, these are some troubling times. This is, this is not a time for change. But Moses is saying that, that God can make changes in your life even during difficult times because the one constant is God himself. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he surpassed all of your expectations in the past, he's going to do it today and is he going to do it tomorrow. Give the Lord a hand. Give the Lord a hand. And there are so many scriptures that remind us that, that he's not slack concerning his promise. He's, his arms are not weak so that he cannot bring them to pass. And it is this God himself who goes before you and he will be with you. He goes before you. And he's also with you. And then he renews a promise that Jesus said at the end of his ministry. He said, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. And because of these promises, he says, do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. So the whole purpose of Peter's letter is to accomplish what Moses himself was trying to accomplish as he's getting ready, ready to depart from this life um, via debt um, and leave the people that he loved. He's telling them, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, God is with you. And that's what I've come today to accomplish in your life, to remind you more than any other time in your life and in our history, both as a church and as a people, that God goes before you, that God is with you, and that God will not forsake you, and even more importantly, he will not fail you. If you will believe that, give the Lord a hand. Glory to God. And to sum it up, I know I have to finish preach. That is enough. Those promises and reassurances that God gives us even now is enough. Is enough. And so, one of the things that I would like to first draw your attention to is found in 1 Peter 5 and 6. And I'll probably spend the portion of my time on this because he reiterated it so many times about being humble and clothe yourself with humility. Because he's given us a secret or a strategy that is actually throughout all of the scripture. And the first thing that I want you to write down and to know, that even as you go through challenging circumstances and fiery trials of your life, is that in the end, God will honor you. Could you write it in? God himself will honor you. And so Peter says, to humble yourselves. He's telling us you can do it. You don't have to be, re be rebellious. You don't have to grumble. You don't have to be conceited or hard-headed. You can humble yourselves, even in tough times. You can bring yourself into subjection or into obedience to the will of God because he gives you the ability to do it. And he's saying, humble yourselves where? Under the mighty hand of God. And in his time, in his good time, he will honor you. He will elevate you, he will exalt you, and he will lift you up. And Peter is expressing that it is God's desire and plan to exalt us at his appointed time after we have suffered for a while. One of the most encouraging teachings of our faith is something that we wrestle with, especially when we're going through hardship. 
And that has to do with the absolute sovereignty of Yahweh our God. That God is sovereign. So it would be God is what? God is sovereign. What does sovereignty mean? You may have heard the word before. Sovereignty is an attribute of God that is based upon the premise that God as the creator of heaven and earth, he has the absolute right and he has full authority to do or allow. Say with me, to do what? To do or allow. So he has the absolute right and he has full authority to do or to allow whatever he desires. The Westminster Confession of Faith states it this way, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordained whatever comes to pass. And the church say, Amen. Amen. Sometimes people get lost in the sovereignty of God and they get lost in their theology and they begin to talk as if, oh, the devil is doing stuff to us and it's almost like God has lost control of the ship and he's lost control of his universe and we have all of these random things of which we must be afraid that is happening to us. But Peter and the apostles and even Moses and all of the ancient prophets made it clear that God is absolutely at all times in full control of the circumstances that we are in. Can someone give God praise right in that moment that God is fully sovereign in every situation we find ourselves in? And can I tell you that is a comforting thought that God is absolutely even now in the midst of our tears and our confusion and our questions and our hardships that he is absolutely sovereign all by himself. And that he's fully in control. The Apostle Paul teaches us in Ephesians 1 and 11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance. Through Christ we have obtained an inheritance. And this inheritance has been predestined or predetermined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his own will. Ephesians 1 and 11, New King James Version. When Peter tells us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, he's inviting us to read God into your story. He's inviting us to stop telling your life as if the system is against you and the man is against you and the governments of the world is against you and your spouse is working against your interests and your children is against you and your parents is against you. You see, Pastor Carl, he, he's saying, I want you to begin to read God into your story. Can you help me by saying, read God into your story? Read God into your story. And I'm going to show you many people who did that. Whenever you begin to tell your story, make God a pivotal subject of your story. Don't tell your story without God. I don't care how painful it is or how odd it is. Begin to let the world know that you believe in a God who is part of your life and he's part of your story. Glory to God. I feel the unction to preach there. And you have to begin to read God into your story. Otherwise, your life is going to sound like it's off script, that it's a mess, and that it's, it's just convoluted. Don't make any sense. But when you begin to interject God into your story, you're going to believe that the sovereign God makes no mistakes from beginning to end. You may think that you may have made a bad choice or a bad mistake, but God absolutely is in control of my life from beginning to end. Make no bones about it. Too many times when life goes south, we begin to wrestle with this sovereign God and we begin to make a mess of our beliefs and our theology. But I've come to straighten out the fact that the God we serve was God before coronavirus. Ooh, I feel it. And he's God during the coronavirus. Glory to God. And here's something for many of you who think that this season is not going to end. I've come to say that he's God post-coronavirus. Can someone give God praise? Hallelujah. God sits on the throne. And no one can take him off. No country has ever had an election to remove God from office. That's a shout right there. No country at all can remove God from office. And I behave the same way. I have prospered under Democratic presidents and I have prospered under Republican president because God remains the same. And the word I look to is the word of God. 
Tell your neighbor God is in control. Well, they don't sound too excited. Tell your next neighbor God is in control. He is all by himself. Read God into your story. And I know it's hard. And so many times we feel that we are being sacrilegious if we begin to make God a pivotal person in our story. But a fact is a fact is a fact. When I told the story of losing my roof in 2017, God was a pivotal part of my story. It didn't change, but it humbled me to make me realize that from beginning to end, He is writing my life, and I could not write it any better. I even now don't want to take the pen from God because I know He has some surprises for me. How many of you know that God has some? Woo, glory to God, right there. I said, I take the good, I take the ugly, I take the bad because you have some surprises for me. I could not write my life any better. Can someone give God praise? I know it's hard. I'm asking you to praise Him when it doesn't feel like it. I could not write my life any better. Couldn't choose anybody better for me. Couldn't give myself any better children or grandchildren. Could not write a better story. Because God is sovereign and I have to read God into my story. Let me show you two examples from the Holy Scriptures so that we can put it in context. When Job's life was turned upside down by a series of tragic circumstances, one after the other, one after the other, listen to Job as he begins to read God into his story. He could have talked about his children dying by violent storms. He could have talked about losing his wealth and failing in his businesses. Instead, this is what he said in Job chapter 1, 22. He says, the Lord gives. And the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of God. The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. <laughs> Blessed be the name of God. Job looked up in the midst of his hardship and began to realize that God was a part of his story. Isn't that a powerful statement of faith? He understood that he was the one in whom he has entrusted his life. Could you turn me to Job 13, 15, another powerful statement of faith? Because it talks about he will never let go of God's hand, even though he leads us to the valley of the shadow of death, or he leads us to difficult times. Job says, do he slay me? Yet will I trust him. How many of you feel like you're right there with Job? We can make that our statement today. Can you give the Lord a hand? Do you slay me? Yet will I trust you. Do you slay me? Yet will I trust you. Blessed be your name forever. Job was reading God into his story. He could have told his story differently. But he made God a part of his story. I bring your attention to the three Hebrew boys in Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 and 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The king came up with this stupid law because of his ego. He made an idol of gold. He commanded them to worship it. And they said, well, you know you got to get people to comply. So he put the most onious punishment on such a stupid law. He said, those who don't bow down and worship this golden image that King, king Nebuchadnezzar has made will be thrown into a fiery furnace. And here was three Hebrew boys, because God says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other graven image. You shall not bow your knee to any other god. In obeying their god, they were brought before the king for violating his ordinance and decree. But you could hear their words as we begin at verse 16 through 18. In Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they replied to the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, say respect, respect. Say with me what? Respect, respect. People lose their respect when they are addressing authority because they are having offenses or hard feelings about what they are going through. Hey, you. And they call people and don't address them by their names. You still have to respect people based on the role or the authority that God has placed in their lives. Can I say that to you? And life is going to put you in some hard places. It can be with parents. You're going to have parents as they age. You're going to feel like, oh, wow. 
And, but you have to remember who's the parent and who's the child. And even though you may have to address certain things, you have to remember that they are your parents. And the Bible says you must do what? Honor your, yeah, don't lose your mind. Honor your parents. Are you hearing me, children? And it's the same thing with wives. God says you must honor your, he also says to husbands you should honor your wives as well. So he asks, he asks for double honor, honor to each person. And so even as you're going through, through difficulties and even as you're arguing, Let's keep respect as part of the equation. And so they are before the king. He's about to throw them to the fire furnace, but they maintain their what? Say with me what? They maintain what? They are re? They maintain their what? Yeah, I'm teaching you about humility. We're right there. They maintain their respect. And so they said, oh, we are not careful to answer you, King Nebuchadnezzar, and we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. For if we are thrown into the blazing furnace because we did not obey your ordinances, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Once again, they made God a part of your story. It may seem like it was just a criminal or legal proceedings, but it made God and read God into your story. Peter's saying when you, when you look into your suffering and when you look into your circumstances, he's asking us to see the hand of God whom you trust. Whom do you trust? God. And he's saying when you look into your suffering, when you look into these extreme hardships, when you look into the circumstances that surround your life, Begin to see the hands of God in your circumstances. The God that you trust. I pray that you see his hand. And then he says you can submit to it knowing that you're going to be okay. If God is there, if he is sovereign and his hand is a part of the circumstances I'm going through, then I can submit not so much to the circumstances, but I can submit to the God who is sovereign in all things, regardless, according to the Hebrew boys, regardless of how it turns out, I could submit to the, the way or the path that he leads me or my life takes because I trust him. The spiritual truth, as Peter is telling us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, he's teaching us that humility, write this down, humility leads to honor and exaltation. How many of you have heard pride does what? Goes where? Pride comes before destruction. And But one of the things we are not very good at, we are very good at repeating that, but humility leads to honor and exaltation. And this is, this is what I want to drive home today because so many people has allowed our American culture and psyche to fill us with pride, to fill us with pride. And we have done it to the point where pride has invaded the Lord's church. And we no longer see the mark of humility as something that we want to bear. But God has called us to humility. He has called us to what? Humility. He has called us to humility. And so we have turned the Lord's church into a parade. Everybody wants an entourage. Everybody wants to come in late with an entourage so that they can be noticed. Everybody wants to draw attention to themselves in their preaching and in their singing and in their prayers. And God says, that is not the way of the Lord's church. The Lord's church is to be marked by humility. Because humility leads to honor. And it leads to exaltation. He says, pride comes before destruction. Because humility will lead the wise. It will clothe the simple with wisdom and lead them to honor and exaltation. Hear the word of the Lord. Apostle James actually almost seems verbatim to say the same thing. If you turn with me to James 4 and verses 10, here is the partner scripture of what Peter is teaching by another apostle. And so you can tell that it was part of the fabric of the early church. Could you turn with me to James 4 and 10? Here's what he says. Humble yourselves. He didn't say under the mighty hand of God. He said, but humble yourselves where? In the sight of the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And then what happens? 
Can someone help me? And what will happen? He will do what? He will lift you up. He will lift you up. Exaltation means to elevate, to lift you up is exaltation. And so he says he will exalt you. He will honor you. He will lift you up. But you have to humble yourselves where? In the sight of God. So many of us have failed the test. Many of us don't know. Many circumstances in life has come to reveal to us that we're full of pride and we're full of self. We don't realize that. When we have pet responses, do it yourself. Get it yourself. I ain't nobody asleep. All of those is just revealing who you are. It's not revealing anything about the person who, may, who may have made the request. They could have used the wrong tone, but it reveals who you are. And the scriptures are saying, in another place, put James 4.10 right next to 1 Peter 5 and 6, the partner verses. If you humble yourselves in the sight of God, God will do what? He, meaning God, shall lift you up. Who will lift you up? Say with me, God. God. Who will lift you up? God. Who will lift you up? That is so important. <laughs> Not call will lift you up. Not that you have to come back to church and say, well, Pastor Carl was humble this week, so I can lift you up. The Bible said that the person who pays attention to your humility is God, and God will lift you up. So when you have the appropriate response to hardships before God, the apostles thought that God will exalt you, he will lift you up, and that God will honor you. The Bible says, if you turn with me to Matthew 23 and verse 12 in the NIV, for those who exalt themselves will be abased, they will be humbled. Did you see that? But those who humble themselves shall be what? Do you see that word again? Exalted means to be lifted up. So they will be honored, they will be lifted up, they will be exalted. When you humble yourselves, the Bible says, and this is Jesus speaking, Jesus who was God in the flesh, he says, you will be what? Exalted. But he says, if you become full of pride, he said, you will be brought low. Lord Jesus Christ is teaching that in Matthew 23, verses 5. Let's go back to James 4 and 6. Here's why James warns us about that about testing our own spirits and examining and assessing ourselves because God resists the proud. God does what? He resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. Say, that's me. That's me. Grace means favor. If you don't know, grace means the unmerited favor of God. But he gives unmerited favor to the humble. Now, this model of humility that we aspire to is the Son of God. In Philippians, in Philippians chapter 2, if you turn with me there, verses 3 to 8, it says Jesus who was and always will be God. At no point did Jesus stop being God. He was God before all of eternity. He became God in the earth. God the Son. And he returned to his status. But at all points he was equal with God. And here's what it says that he did not regard the eternal equality with God that was his, something to hold on to. But he divested himself. He gave it up. He gave him up all of the privileges of having that position or identity. And he became a slave. He became a servant. He became a man. He came all the way down, not just to earth, in a manger that we are celebrating during this time of the event, but he humbled himself to dine on a cross. The cross was reserved. It was what you call the electric chair. It was the chief penalty. It was reserved for treasons. And it was reserved for people who have done abominable things in the earth. He humbled himself even to the point of dying on the cross. And you know he's doing that because that is what we deserve. He's dying for your sins and for my sins. And that is the model of humility that God is calling us yet. Never was one so high who descended so low. And in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, it says that Jesus was gentle and he was humble where? In heart. Do you know there's a fake humility? There's people who full of pride actually uses humility to draw attention to themselves. And they know they're doing it. He's saying, but that's not where you find true humility. Humility is where? In the heart. Humility is where it doesn't matter. Humble people don't draw the fact to the fact. 
Do you see how humble I am? That is actually pride. Humble people don't, don't even know they're humble. When you say, man, you're so humble, they look at you like, what you're talking about? They're not even aware because it's where? It's part of their psyche. It's part of who they are. It's in their spirit. It's engraved in who they are. And Jesus was gentle and humble where? In his heart. He was true humility. Say with me, true humility. He was the demonstration, a manifestation of what I call true humility. And now let's go back to Philippians 2 and 9 because I'm showing you the connection. And I showed it to you in James and I showed it to you in Peter. But here is something that I want you to observe. And after the Apostle Paul was speaking about the humility of Christ, he, he came to Philippians 2 and 9, he says, And for this reason also, for which reason? For his true humility, because he was truly humble, because he humbled himself and denied himself and divested himself of being equal to God. For this reason, God has highly exalted him. Do you see that, dear? Because of the humility of Christ, God has highly exalted him. Because of the humility of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, God the Father did what? He highly exalted him. Could you give the Lord a hand for his consistency? And so we see God over and over again honoring his word. God has highly exalted him. And he has bestowed upon him a name that is above every name. So your attitude and my attitude if you are a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, should be the same as that of Christ himself. Say with me, the same, the same. Philippians actually told us that. He says, let this mind be in you which was Christ, in Christ Jesus. He was saying, we must have the same attitude that Christ had. And so the apostle Paul in Ephesians 4 and 2, he admonishes us to be completely humble. Not 50%, not 40%, not 80%, not 90%, but to be what? Completely humble. Say with me, I must be completely humble. And listen, I'm preaching to me as well. That must be hard to do. But that's what we are called to, to be completely humble. And he went on and said, to also be gentle and patient, bearing with one another in love. Bearing with one another in love. God commands us to cultivate humility. So here's the sum of the teaching. Humble yourselves before God. And we do so by accepting his word. And that is demonstrated through obedience. And we do so by accepting his sovereignty. And that's why James says, humble yourselves in the sight of God. And that is acknowledging that he is present, that he's a part of our lives and accepting his sovereignty. And Peter says, Sum humble yourselves or submit yourselves or accept or submit under the sovereignty of God, his mighty hands. And to do it without grumbling. And also, Philippians 2, verses 1 and 5 say, we must humble ourselves by serving others and putting their interests before our own. That is the ways that we actually practice and nurture and cultivate humility in our lives. In Mark 9, 35, sitting down, Jesus called his 12 disciples around him, those who are going to become spiritually mature and lead the church as elders. He says, if anyone wants to be first, if anyone wants to be great, he must be the very last. And he's talking about putting yourself in that position and he must become the servant of all. He must become the servant of all. And when we do that, God honors us and he lifts us up. He exalts us. Here's why. Could you tell me the Proverbs 3 in verse 34? King Solomon said, God gives favor. That's grace. Unmerited favor. God gives great favor to the humble. He does what? He gives what? Favor to the humble. Amen. A lot of us want the favor of God. But we don't want to clothe ourselves with humility. But he gives favor to the humble. 
you know, you're going to come to the end of your life and realize that all the things you're fighting for, God wants to give you. I just smile on that. You're going to come to the end of your life to realize that all the things you're fighting for, all the things you want to fight family for and deny other people that God wants to give you. Can I say that his success is good success? And it says that his success doesn't cause us to lose sleep, right? It doesn't cause us to lose sleep. And it comes without pain. It comes without pain. That is the success that God wants to give us, the honor that God wants to put upon our lives. And he's saying that he gives favor to those who are humble. The life of a humble person is a mystery. Here's another saying, Psalms 25, 9. I want you to get this. And the reason is because he guides the humble. And the only, only reason he guides the humble is those are the only people he can guide. Unless you, you submit to God, he can't guide you. And the people who can't submit to God are people who are filled with pride. And those are the people who resist his word. But he says whenever you, you humble yourselves and begin to operate in obedience to God's word, that is humility, then God can guide you. God can do what? Guide you. And that's what a lot of people don't understand about the tide. Tide is about you humbling yourself to God so God can do what? Guide you. And that's why your finances are a mess because you don't want to humble yourself before God because you think you're going to make more speed keeping your 100%. And God said, what I really want to see is whether you're going to humble yourselves to me, make me first place in your life, so then I can guide you with the rest of your finances. That is what God wants to do. God wants to guide you. How many of you would like to be guided by God? And you know why? Because he's already made it clear. For his ways are not our ways, neither is his thoughts our ways. His ways and his thoughts are far better. Could you give the Lord a hand? It's far better. <clears throat> and God wants to guide you, but he can only guide the humble. He can only guide the humble. And he will guide you in what is right. And he will teach you his way. Psalms 25, 9. In Proverbs 11, 2, it, tell us, it tells us when pride comes, then comes what? Disgrace. You ever hear old people say, you're too hardened. That's pride. You don't listen. That's pride. Nobody can tell you anything. That's pride. And it says pride leads to disgrace and destruction. Who don't hear or do what? Feel. That's pride. All of these things are actually talking about pride. And they're saying the same thing in different ways. Pride. Are you there? When pride comes, then comes what? Disgrace. But with the humble, there is wisdom. In Psalms 18, 27, it says, And God saves the humble. God saves the humble, but he brings low those who have a proud look, those who are full with pride. He brings them low. Now here's a scripture that I want you to meditate and make a part of your devotion. I want you to make this a part of the scriptures that you've committed to memory. And I'd like for you to learn it because it's easier in this translation. In Proverbs 22, verse 4, New Living Translation. Remember you say that Christ was gentle and humble in his heart. He had true humility. Here's what King David says. He says, true, true humility, meaning if, you ha if they have to say that humility is true, there could be a false humility. Hmm? People pretend to be humble, but it's just a guise. It's just a deception. It's fake. <laughs> fake news. <laughs> I get to use that in the sermon, fake news. But here's what Proverbs 24, 22, verse 4 says. True humility and the fear of the Lord leads. Do you see that word again? It does what? Leads. It does what? There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof is death. But then there's a way that God gives us that the world doesn't value. The world doesn't value humility. The world thinks that, ah, this is, this is rubbish, this is nonsense. It seems like foolishness to them. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound, to confuse the mighty because they don't get it. 
They don't understand who then begins to work for you behind the scenes. And he says when you're truly humble and you've clothed yourselves with the fear of God, it will lead, and I want you to underline three things it leads to. It leads to riches. Did you see that? It leads to honor. Don't put them together. And it leads to what? It leads to riches. It leads to honor. And it leads to give the Lord a hand. Hallelujah. And so the scriptures are teaching you that God wants to honor you. And he will do it for those who will humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. Those of you who will embrace his word. Make it a part of your life, your daily devotion, but make it a part of your life in terms of obedience, of obeying his word. And also embracing the sovereignty of God because he leads us in ways that we cannot imagine. He leads us down paths that we would not have led ourselves. But can I tell you that it's true, the most difficult seasons of my life that God has led me, it has also led me into the best of my life. Can I tell you, it has led me to, into what? The best of my life. We can only celebrate that Sire lives because he was threatened by death. And because there was a moment of 25 minutes where life spoke of a terrible end. But God delivered us out of them all. Can someone give God praise? He delivered us out of them all. And, and people don't like to talk about it because it's, if people don't know, they say, well, don't keep reminding them because of all the, the shortcomings of your life. But my life has had a lot of ugly spots. But I tell you the truth, something that Paul says, that he is working all things out for my good. And that's a scripture verse, that God is working all things out for my good. I'm going to share a very personal story to me because I cried. I cried because I didn't have the understanding. I was in Houston for medical treatment, and we were up there for a while, and, and I went through a whole week of being faced with, with the reality, what if this thing goes south? Just like the me, Re, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what if this thing goes south? What happens if God doesn't deliver you? What happens if it runs its course and it turns out the way that the world says it turns out and it comes to this tragic, terrible end? What then? And I became very concerned. I became a man who would cry for no reason. How many of you have been there? I'll be going to the cafeteria, stand in line, I'll start crying. Because of the reality that was before me. But I keep um, denying that truth and keep speaking the truth of God. How many of you know you need to practice? Every time your mind gets clouded with this is the way it has to go, you say, no, I'm not accepting that and speak the truth of God. And it take, listen, it wears you out. It wears you out to deny the reality that's before you and embrace a reality that seems to be far-fetched. But I kept doing it and I kept doing it. And in that moment, I was praying to God about life. I was concerned about life. I wanted to live. So bad I wanted to live. And so I was praying for that end. Oh God, whatever you can, turn this around. Make it so that this is not the case. Make it so that it's not the case. And in that week, I heard another story that told me about life. And now hearing about life made me sad. And say with me, ironic, ironic. When I was faced with a situation that spoke of death, I became sad and I cried. When I was told of another situation that spoke about life, I got sad and I cried because life was coming and not on my terms. Life was being introduced to me and not on my terms. And, and I listened to the voice of my son as he's telling me about life. And I became sad. I became sad because of all of the years that I've invested in my family, teaching them the way to go. I became sad because there are so many realities that are presented to you about how the world responds to that kind of news, but I rejected it. I embraced God's way. And I said something to my son because it's what he said to me, and I confirmed with him. I said, that's the way I raised you. He says, Dad, I only want to do what is right. And I said to him, and I want you to do what is right. And that's what we did. And so I went upstairs, and I got into bed, and for the first time, I'm shaking the bed. Reva was asleep. She says, Carl, what's wrong? And I started to cry. She says, why are you crying? I said, you will think that as you're going through circumstances in life, life will wait for one season to end before it starts another. But there are times when the circumstances of your life overlaps and it becomes more than you can bear. I'm telling you about the sovereignty of God, but I'm using real life situations. When I told her what was before us, 
I said, but God himself will work it out for our good and for his glory. Could you give the Lord a hand? He was going to do it. And I'm saying so and I have no clue. Say with me, no clue. No clue. I don't know how he was going to do it. But I knew that he was a God that do not lie. I've lived my life and I can say that with confidence at 52. He's a God and he does not lie. He does not lie. Someone give the Lord a hand. He does not lie. I, I, I felt the pain and the, the, the every emotion that clouded my mind. But can I bring you to the recent moment? Life went on. And I've had out of that life circumstance some of the most beautiful moments. I had the beautiful memory and moment of marrying my son and having a wonderful celebration where all of the leaders of my church showed up to celebrate with me the goodness of our God. Could you give the Lord a hand? Showed up. We were given a church when that was not our fate. They were Lutheran church. They let us use their church, their chapel for that ceremony, another blessing of God. And it reminds me that I have to return and honor the honor that was placed upon my life to be able to do it. You don't understand. And then God gave us a beautiful villa in St. John. A villa that belonged to someone of celebrity status. And it rents for incredible amounts of money. But he gave it to us for, if I tell you the amount, it would almost seem shameful. So let me say for next to nothing. Can you accept that? Come, I'm giving you a lot of information for next to nothing. And I got to be a part of that story. I got to be a part of the story of now being the grandfather of two intelligent, good-looking grandchildren, Sire and Sage, because God works all things out for our good and for his glory. Are you hearing me? Give the Lord a hand. It may not come how you want it. But when God works in your circumstances, he makes it good. Hallelujah. You may think it was for your shame, but it's for his good for your good and for his glory. Can I tell you, I lost my home, all personal circumstances, and I humbled myself, showed up at another church because we were displaced, and I only could put on what I had. I had a crumpled up jean pants that I found. It was the only pants that didn't have mold on it. And I had a pair of sneakers that looked like it was through a storm. My shirt was not ironed because there was no power. And I showed up at another person's church. And you know what they did? They asked me to preach. I cried in my car. I said, God, you, what do you expect me to say now? Because I only think you can speak of God when life is good. But I went in there and preached a sermon that so many people still reminds me of. It had no title, so I give it one. I've come today to talk to you out of my pain. That's the topic I gave it. And, and God led me. But you know, today he's given me back a house that is the same three bedrooms but bigger, two bathrooms but bigger. Now has an apartment that I'm refurbishing for my son and his family. And the house I had before didn't have an extra dwelling. And I share all of that to you because life humbled me. But I've learned in every situation to humble myself under the mighty hand of God. And he himself, whom God will honor you. If you believe that, give the Lord a hand. The Lord himself will honor you. So there you have it. You have it from the lives of people written in the ancient text. You have it from the life of your minister. And I truly believe that as we clothe ourselves with humility, God will lead us to riches, honor, and long life. So I'm closing, but there's two other things that he tells us he will do for us. And this is the second thing he tells us is that God will take care of you. Could you write that down? And so you're going through a suffering, but he says, hey, sire. He says, suffer for a little while, but God will honor you. And then the next thing he wants you to know that God will take care of you. And here's a beautiful truth. He says, 
that you can cast what? All your care upon him. Cast how much? Cast how much? Cast all your care upon him for he cares for you. I remember one time I was speaking to a brother. His name comes to me was Brother um, Greg Penn. And he latched on to the word cast. And back then, I was just human. I said, man, everybody could preach the same verse and focus on something different. And when he focused on that word cast, it just stood out for me. And so that's the word I like for you to understand today is the cast. Because so many times we are busy bringing to Jesus what he tells us to throw. So we do what? Throw. He says to you, do what? He says to you, do what? He says to do you? Throw all your cares. And many of us don't want to let go of them because they are our pet cares. And so we are bringing our cares to Jesus. That's not what his servant tells us to do. He says to cast or to throw all his cares upon him for he cares for you. Can't throw that. Can't throw that. But I can throw this, right? And this is what throw does. This is carry. But this is true. True is this. That's true. It creates distance. Say with me what? Distance between you and your problems. Give the Lord a hand. And the Lord wants many of you to create distance between you and your problems. God wants you to create distance between you and your problems. To throw all that concerns you on the Lord Jesus Christ. To do it in worship, to do it in prayer, and to do it in confidence. Knowing if he hears you, he will answer you in accordance to his will and his divine purpose. Here is two other scriptures that I want to add to your repertoire. And I'm going to ask you to memorize it because of the word no. Are you ready? Could you tell me the first John 5 and 15? And here is what the apostle John says. And since we do what? We know. Say we do what? We know. And since we know he hears us, when we make our prayers or requests, we also know, you see the word know, that he will give us what we ask for. Isn't that beautiful? How many of you can say you know? Those are two powerful things to know. He says, since you know that God hears you when you pray, how many of you feel like when you're praying that God hears you? You got to come to that place when, when you're in your room and you're in your bathroom, when you're in your secret place and you're crying your tears, don't think that you're losing your mind and you're going crazy. God is hearing you when you pray. You got to know. Say, I know. Say, I know. And the Bible says, since I know he hears me when I pray, I also know that he will answer me. Woo. Not only will he answer me, but he will give me what I ask for. What confidence. Hallelujah. What confidence. Here's the third note that I want you to leave here with. And it's found in Romans 8, 22. And it says, and we do what? We know. Say we do what? We know that in all things, God is working for the good of those who love him. Who have been called according to his purpose. If you walk into this room unsure of anything else in your life, I want you to leave in knowing that God hears your prayers. Knowing that if he hears your prayers, that he will also answer you in accordance to his will, in accordance to your petition. And the third, no, I want you to know that he's working all things even now out for your good, according to his purpose and his word. How many of you believe that? As a statement of faith, could we just stand and celebrate the three things that we know today? Can we give the Lord a hand for knowing, for knowing with certainty that God is a God who hears our prayers, that he is a God who will answer us, and that he's a God who will work all things out for our good in accordance to his will. If you truly embrace knowing that with certainty, could you give the Lord a hand? Could you give the Lord a better hand? Could you give the Lord a hand? I'm telling you to make a statement by faith as you are celebrate the God of heaven. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now you may be seated. I want you to participate. I want you to get into your spirit. And here's the last thing that God says he will do, even as he did in Deuteronomy. He 
says that God will restore you. Are you hearing me? And that's what I'm looking for in 2021. For the people of God is restoration. One of the most difficult aspects of suffering is not so much that we have to go through stuff. Sometimes the most difficult aspect of suffering is the ground or the momentum that we lose in the process. Many times our problems not only slow us down, sometimes our problems pushes us back. It knocks us back. And I'm not talking about just knocks us back by several steps. It sometimes pushes us back by many years, several years in our progress. And sadly, because of the tough times we're going through, we have just not sure or even know or we're nowhere close to where we used to be in life. We all have setbacks. But in Peter, God is making us a promise that these setbacks are temporary. Listen to Peter's words. He says that after you've suffered a little while, and after these sufferings have set you back, God himself will restore. He will support, and he will strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. 1 Peter 5.10 What a promise. God is promising to restore you post-COVID. Are you hearing me? He says he will put you back where you belong. Glory to God. He will put you back where you belong. He will support you. The Greek means to make us solid as a rock. He will strengthen you. This is an athletic term. Peter saying God will give you the muscle, the stamina to do what you need to do. He placed you on a firm foundation. He put you on solid ground where you will never be shaken or moved. No matter what you're going through right now, this is what God has in mind for you and your future. And because God's plans and promises to you, Peter's encouraging us to enjoy. Say so with me to do what? To enjoy. To do what? To enjoy. He says, because of his promises that he will honor you, that he's going to take care of you, and that he will restore you, he says, take a firm stand. Take a firm stance where you are against the devil, your enemy, and be strong in your faith. 1 Peter 5 and 9. In closing, Peter wrote, my purpose in writing is to encourage you. My purpose during the series was to encourage you and also to assure you that the grace of God is with you no matter what happens. Remember, as my Christian brothers and sisters, even like our Christian brothers and sisters all over the world who are going through the same sufferings like you, that God is faithful. That he will not place upon us more than we can bear. But with every situation, he's already planned our escape. When you face hard times and all of us suddenly will, and we certainly are right now, Peter wants to remind you that you are not the only one experiencing things that you would not have welcomed, that you do not want to be part of your story. The loss of loved ones children that may seem in your estimation to be going the wrong way there's a lot of little nagging things that comes across your mind but he wants you to know that you're not the only one that are faced with these concerns you're not the only one experiencing hardships you're not the only one that has stuff that tests your faith but he wants you to be strong no matter what happens because God's grace is with you you can enjoy anything life throws at you. And you are in good hands. Because you are in God's hands. He will honor you. He will take care of you. And he will certainly restore you. He said in his good time. And the church say, Amen. If you believe that, could you stand all over this room? Every boy, woman, we're all 
in need of prayer in this moment. We are praying for ourselves, but for each other. Glory to God. And since we can't hold the, the hand of the person next to us because of COVID, could we just lift our hands up and just be holding each other's hands as we hold the hands of our God? Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your encouragement to your servants, the apostles, even to your servant Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. They have written such incredible truths about who you are, the attributes of our God, and they themselves have suffered hardships. They have endured circumstances in this life that would seem that they were more than any mortal could bear. But they have seen your handiwork, your faithfulness, your kindness, your benevolence. You are God who's full of compassion, even now. And that you are guiding those who submit to you in humility and grace. We submit our lives to your divine providence and care. We acknowledge your sovereignty over our lives and over our church, over our futures, over our dreams, over what we aspire to become and to have in the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ. And we're asking you to continue to guide us. Guide us where we have lost faith. Guide us where our hearts are filled with despair. Guide us, Father God, when we become absolutely confused and darkened in our minds. Help us to see the light of who you are that is revealed from your holy scriptures. And help us to pursue you above all else. To pursue you above all else. To pursue you above all else because in you is the source of life. Is the answers to our questions. In Jesus' mighty name. Jesus' mighty name. And then Father, I'm asking you to do for these people. As we stand solemnly before thy great name. I'm asking you to do for these people what they are trusting you for. That in accordance to your holy word that has been spoken over your lives, that you in due season, in your good time, would you honor them? Would you exalt them? Would you lift them up? Father God, would you care for them? Would you comfort them? Would you restore them? And would you place their feet on a firm foundation so that they will not be moved in this life and in the life to come? To Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all God's people say, Amen. And now I want to bless you. And now may the grace of our Lord, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may the rest remain and abide with you now and always, even forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen and Amen. We give the Lord a hand for His word. We love you. Thank you for being here. The word has gone forth. I pray that you pay attention to the scriptures and as you go forth, May you continue to share the love that God has placed in your heart with all your fellow men. God honor you as you leave the sanctuary. And have an amazing day. Amen. You are dismissed.